Thank you everyone, welcome. Welcome to everyone here at Friends House today and everybody online as well. And we're here to kick off a year of celebrations for our 75th anniversary. So my name is Imrana Gumra and I'm one of the co-chairs of Silips Health Libraries Group and I'll be chairing the first session this morning. A little bit of housekeeping first. So the fire alarm test was this morning so we're not expecting anything. There will be, if there is, if we do need to exist, if, exist, if we do need to exit, the fire exits there, there, and there. <laughs> and there will be Friends House um, staff able to assist you guys. So for those of you online, please follow local procedures should you need to. Right. So we have the restrooms on the that side that's the left isn't it yeah. refreshments on the right <laughs> so please do help yourselves you are fine to bring in refreshments back into this room at lunchtime if the weather permits do help go outside into the courtyard etc um so the sponsors and sense therapy where the chair massages are are on your left there so please do go and visit and if you missed it there is a cloak room if you want to deposit your bags um and coats. So, at SILIP and HLG have a duty to provide a friendly, safe and welcoming environment for all participants. Our ethical framework commits us to uphold, promote and defend intellectual freedom. We ask that all contributions are made with respect within the context of professional discourse and are related to the subject matter of the event. The co-chairs and HLG committee have the absolute right to take appropriate corrective action in response to behavior, comments, or contributions outside the code of conduct. So if you have any questions during the day, please do ask committee members. We're waiting lanyards that say HLG committee, or ask anyone at reception, or leave a message for us if you, if you don't find us. If you're online, please do leave a message um, for, on the chat, and our online facilitators will respond. So we do have a scribe in the audience today. There's Annalise. And we have a photographer as well. Um, if, you, John's just over there. if you are averse to having your photograph taken, then just let John know. We will be using um, photographs on the HLG website and in promotional material. Please do tweet using hashtag HLG75 and copy in the um, HLG um, account as well, please. So our first session this morning um, is all about celebrating the past, present, and future of health librarianship. And when I say librarianship, I mean um, I include the whole breadth of knowledge and information management across the health sector. So without further ado, I would like to invite David Stewart to take the stage and give us some reflections on his being an active and engaging member of the community. David was a past uh, chair and also a past president of SILIP. Thank you, David. Thank you, Imrana, and uh, good morning, everyone. A little bit of interactivity doesn't go amiss. Did anyone get up before six o'clock? Well, that wasn't worth trying, was it? Um, it really is great to be physically here with all of you today, in person, and of course, it's, it's great to uh, welcome all of those of you who are online as well. It's also great to see faces that I don't know, a real sign that our profession renews itself time and time again, though that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the old faces, um, and I think you know who you are. I would like to thank Silip HLG Committee for inviting me to open today's event celebrating 75 years since the founding of Health Libraries Group. It's a great privilege to be asked to do this. So. 
Long ago, and not too far away in Ridgemount Street, I joined Health Libraries Group Committee, having served on the Nursing Interest Subgroup Committee that later became Libraries for Nursing. And I joined as an ordinary committee member, I promise. Um, and after a while, having turned up to some meetings and there being various vacancies, I took responsibility, first of all, for international affairs, which sadly turned out not to include any international travel. Um, then I looked after publications. Um, then I was treasurer. And then finally, I was chair. Uh, you'll notice I never, ever volunteered to be secretary. Way too much work. You know, just don't. And I admire immensely the people who take on secretarial roles for groups and committees. Imrana has kindly shared some committee notes and annual reports from the late 1990s when I was chair. And a number of things struck me about them, reading them really for the first time since the late 1990s. Um, firstly, just how many people were involved in, in HLG? 16 people on the committee plus a representative from the then LA Council, the Library Association, a member of Library Association staff, and a whole series of co-opted members, observers, representatives from subgroups. That made up 26 people. And some, some names were there too. I mean, obviously everyone had a name, but I just, <laughs> duh, I just picked out Sally Hernando, Julie Ryder, Alan Doherty, Judy Palmer, Margaret Forrest, Bruce Madge, Veronica Fraser, I could go on and on. We build on the shoulders of giants. We're also keen to make sure that at the time that there were people on, the, on HLG from all of the English regions and from the UK home nations. And as a reminder, SILIP and its group have always been UK-wide bodies. HLG was always very well organised, delivering its work through a whole series of panels or working groups, one on CPD, international, membership and marketing, publications, which included the journal, um, prizes and awards, and also subgroups, community care, um, network, information for the management of healthcare, libraries for nursing. The CPD offer was always absolutely central to what HLG did. And I see the 1999 programme was made up of 11 events, everything from search skills uh, to advances in knowledge management and from writing bids to clinical governance. Not much changes. We also had uh, a stall at LA Umbrella Conference that year and within Umbrella we put on seven separate events focused on, on, on health librarianship. And the issues we talked about, well, Lots of receiving reports, obviously. Um, planning the International Congress of Medical Librarianship Number 8, which was held in London in 2000. Uh, negotiating with Blackwells on how much of the money they made from Health Libraries Journal, Health Libraries Review, they would share with committee, with the group rather. Copyright, we always seem to be talking about copyright. I don't think that's changed either. Uh, research, how to grow the membership. And interestingly, the changes we needed to make um, as SILIP came into being, and there was a little subgroup looking at logos, but not a sub-subgroup looking at fonts or a sub-subgroup, no, never mind. All of that work, all of that work, will have been built on the work of previous committees and members, and will, I'm sure, have contributed to the well-organised and dynamic HLG we have today. A group that offers CPD to support lifelong learning, a fantastic professional journal, advice support for members, fast commentary back to SILIP on government policies that affect all of us, and much else beside. So that was my review of the papers from 1999. Um, sadly, I had to print them out. Can't quite synthesize on screen. At the beginning, I said it was a real privilege to be asked to open this event today. So um, you've probably spotted the slightly bright outfit and the, the medal. It was a huge honor to be awarded an MBE in the Queen's New Year's Honours in 2021. The pandemic meant that there was no investitures that year and not until this year. So my sister and I went to Windsor Castle in February. 
and lo and behold, um, you'll see me, uh, but the key point is, um, is there a pointer on this? Oh yes, look, there's my sister, right on the edge. And if you frame it, she gets cut out completely, <laughs> which is really very sad, she's most cross. Um, we had no idea um, until we were right inside Windsor Castle who we were going to get, and we were speculating on uh, the Princess Royal or, or the, 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 uh, the Earl of Wessex and so on. And at the last minute, we heard it was going to be His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Charles. Um, if any of you want to know more about what happens on the day, I can talk about it, sadly, at length, um, but maybe another day, but happy to chat about it later on. The citation reads, for voluntary service to information management and his contribution to the National Health Service. And I accepted that award not only for myself, but on behalf of everyone working in health libraries. We don't always have a very high profile, so every little helps. Nothing I have achieved since I started work in 1978 would have been possible without my colleagues, without the networks that one builds over time, without all of you, and without the amazing programs of work and networking opportunities that HLG provides. So thank you to all of you and thank you to HLG. I do want to pause here and also acknowledge the support I had from my partner of 30 years, uh, Chris, and thank you to everyone for their kindness and support since his sudden death in May this year. Every time I went to see him in hospital, a nurse would say, are you the one with the MBE? <sighs> he told everybody, and he was so, so proud. Finally, HLG and its members, all of you, you make a difference every day to the organization you work for, to its clinicians and to its managers and to its researchers, to students of every kind, and of course, ultimately, to patients, carers, and families, some of you meeting their needs directly. Every day, healthcare organizations and their staff and learners need evidence and know-how to deliver up-to-date, safe healthcare. We are a fabulous profession, and you really do make a difference every day. HLG is a crucial part of that process, May it have a fabulous future and another 75 years. Thank you. Thank you, David. So now I will introduce our speakers for the first session, looking at the past, present and future. Um, first up is Lindsay Hawker, my co-chair of HLG, who will be taking us through the history of the evolution of HLG, followed by Ruth Carlyle, who is our policy lead, who will be talking about the current lands landscape, and finally, Sue Lacey Bryant, um, current chair of Sillip Board of Trustees, who will take us into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Imbrana, and I've never followed an MBE before, so this is quite exciting. <laughs> um, it's so lovely to finally be here and to see so many of you in the room and online. Um, today is actually the 75th anniversary of the very first meeting, so we are meeting on our birthday, so it's so lovely to be here to celebrate it. Um, as Imrana said, I'm going to go back to the very start and handily sort of go up to round about the 90s, so I think David and I are on point today. Um, and then after that, I'll pass on to my colleague Ruth, who's going to talk, bring us up to date and look at where we sit today in the health landscape, and then Sue will take us into the future. So, right back to the beginning. We had actually tried to form health library groups before 1947, but for various reasons, they'd never really come together. So it wasn't until the 14th of October in 1947 when the Library Association's medical section met together for the very first time that things began to change. So at that very first meeting, there was 33 people in the room. By the end of the fortnight, that had doubled in size. And by the end of the year, there was over 100 people from all over the country as part of the, part of the group. <laughs> it's hard to say why it was successful that time round, but part of it, I think, was just good timing. The, um, the profession was growing. The, the outside health landscape was changing. The NHS was on the horizon. It would come into being in 1948. 
so there was more health libraries and therefore there was more health librarians and so it was time that there was a group to support them. When I talk about health librarians at the time, it's probably slightly different to the definition we would use today. The people that was in that first room were all people who were working in academic institutions, so people who were delivering to the medical schools, to dentist schools and to pharmacy. Or they would be members of professional organisations such as the Royal Colleges or the Wellcome or something like the King's Fund where, where I work today. And actually this slide shows the King's Fund Library in 1948 because we, we formed around about the same time. So I thought I'd put it in there to illustrate what, what a library would look like at the time. Um, there were hospital libraries at the time and I'll come back to them in a second, but they, weren't, they were working in a slightly different way and weren't part of this original group. Before I come back to them, though, the other reason I think we were successful in 1947 was circumstance. World War II was still really fresh in people's mind. Um, and as you can see, it was quite difficult to be a librarian during that time. Um, people were literally working with no building to have a service out of. Collections were going missing, getting damaged. And of course, the workforce was diminishing as they were going off to, to help in the war effort. Um, so people had to start working differently and things that we think take for granted today, things like interlibrary loans, really started to come into their own at this time. Of course, there was no internet, um, so people were travelling from one library to another. And as they were doing that, they were meeting their colleagues and they were talking and talking about the problems that they were having, the fact that they'd lost a roof <laughs> and what they could do about it. Um, and people realised the value in that. Um, so people were when the war finished and, and libraries carried on, so did that sort of sense of camaraderie. And I think that's something, looking back at this history and, and people talking about why the Health Libraries Group came together then, it really struck a chord with the sort of things that we've been going through in the last couple of years. You know, um, again, talk, in a slightly different context, but people losing their building, collections being inaccessible, struggling with workforce. It all sounds vaguely familiar, and I think the reason that Health Libraries Group is so important is to have that network so people can come together, share their problems, and actually find solutions as well. So, let me come back to the hospital libraries I mentioned a second ago. As I say, they did exist in the 1940s and 50s, but at the time, they were run by public librarians. Um, they served patients in hospitals, and also people in sort of related institutions. So they were providing services for um, people in care organisations, people in prison. Um, so it was a diff very different group to the sort of academic uh, professional team that was happening in the, the, the Library Association's medical section. Um, during that time, they were fairly informal. People were being seconded out to work in, li in, the, in the hospital libraries. They were often part time. Um, the service hours weren't particularly standard, so um, it was a very baby um, profession, I guess. But that started to change in the 1950s. Things became more standardised. By the end of that decade, there would be people full-time in hospital libraries. And the service was starting to expand as well. So as well as providing those services for patients, they were also starting to provide clinical services as well. So by 1962, there was a need for a new special interest group, and that's when the Hospital Libraries and Handicapped Readers Group, as it was called at the time, came into being. And that group served, as it says on the, on the group here, those people who were working in hospital libraries and, and similar care organisations. And through the 1960s, those two groups continued to go side by side, but increasingly they found that people were overlapping. There was a lot of members that were in one group and in the other, and actually a lot of the time they were working together on particular things. So there was guidance on what a hospital library should look like that the, the medical section would help with, um, and there was directories to tell people what sort of books you should have in a medical library, and that was the coming together from both of those groups. Um, so it became more and more apparent that actually we should join forces, come together. And in 1978, that's exactly what happened. So the, um, the hospital libraries group and the medical section became the medical health and welfare libraries group. Not easy to say, neither is MHWLG. <laughs> I'm so glad we changed it. <laughs> 
Um, so all through the, 19, the end of the 1970s, all through the 80s, that group really thrived. And I think David mentioned some of the, the activities and the subgroups um, in his speech there. So it really did show the length and breadth of hospital of, of health librarians um, and health in its widest sense. So there were subgroups for the nursing, for people working in nursing libraries. There were subgroups for people working in health management. There's bibliotherapy. There was um, groups for people working in social care, all sitting under that big umbrella of the MHWLG group. Now, this is starting to look a little bit more familiar. Um, at the beginning of the 90s, the group reviewed again. And part of that, I think, was because, again, what was happening in the external landscape, um, care was moving from hospitals out into the community, and so some of the subgroups that you had seen under MHWLG were beginning to sort of become independent um, and work separately. So at that point, it was decided for the um, MHW the W to be dropped. <laughs> um, and the M at that time went as well. So we became the much easier to remember and the much easier to say HLG. I really want to concentrate on that H and what that means to us back then and also today. So again, the landscape is changing. As integrated care systems come in, all of us are coming back together under that big umbrella, and that H really does stand for health in its widest sense. So Health Libraries Group today, as always, is here for everybody across um, health and social care. Now, that does sound like I've almost come up to date, but before I go, I do want to just go back through and look at some of the achievements that we have made over those 75 years. Um, many of these, although the name has changed, these... these um, different publications and activities have been happening right back since we started. Um, so I wanted to start, and as David mentioned as well with her publications, Health Information and Libraries Journal, that has actually been going since 1978 when MHWLG came into to being. It started off as a newsletter by 1984. It was a um, recognised academic journal being published four times a year. Back then it was the Libraries Review. Today we know it as the Health Information and Libraries Journal. Um, and I want to say thank you to Maria and the whole editorial team for all the work they do to make that happen. And of course to Wiley who published the journal and have kindly sponsored the event today. Next up I want to mention HLISD or the Health Libraries and Information Services Directory or just Health Lizard depending who you talk to. Um, that's also been going since the 1950s. That's a directory that brings all health libraries together so you can find us. It's been running as a paper journal right up until 2002, and I find this really scary. It's been online for 20 years. It started in 2002 as an online resource and continues today. So again, thank you to David Law, who is our national manager, to HEE, who sponsor, uh, sponsor it alongside HLG, and to everybody on the board that makes that possible, and also to Artifacto for making it look so nice. <laughs> Um, I also want to mention our core collections. Again, they've been running since Friday back in 1957. Back then, I sort of mentioned this briefly, they were, that was the medical section put that together and it was recommended texts from medical libraries. Nowadays, we have three collections. We have the medical one, we have a mental health one, and we have a nursing and midwifery one, which has literally just been updated this week and is now available online. So again, thank you to Preeti and the team for putting that together and to Tomlinson's who... Um, published the, the core collections, but also um, sponsored our event today too. I could go on about more um, publications, but I have limited time, so I, I hope David's mentioned some of them as well. Let me push on. <laughs> I also want to talk about some of the awards we give out as well. Um, going right back to 1950s again, um, that's when the Cyril Barnard Award was, um, first came into being. Now, that's been awarded every three years since then to people who have um, given outstanding... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Achievement to health libraries. Um, alongside that, that normally gives, that gets bought out at our um, conferences that have happened every two years. Of course, they haven't happened for the last few years, so it, again, it's doubly nice to be back in a room with people today. Um, but alongside the Cyril Barnard Award, we often have the um, Leslie Bishop, Bishop in the Faneuil Lecture. That's an opportunity for people who are related to health and librarianship to come and speak to us um, at that conference. 
Slightly more recently, I also want to mention the Leslie Morton Award, which started in 2009, and that goes back to the international work that David mentioned. And that, that bursary exists to allow people to go and speak at international conferences, which hopefully, again, as things start to go back to normal, we'll be able to do again soon. The reason I mention all of them together is that each of those names are part of that original 33 that I mentioned right at the start. So we commemorate them in the, um, the awards that we give out. Um, I also want to mention them in the, in the um, context of international awards because that group of people were responsible for bringing the very first International Congress of Medical Librarians to London in 1953. Um, and hot off the press, I think it's OK to say that we hope that we'll be able to put a bid in to host the next one in 2026. But we don't know yet. <laughs> um, our international work cont continues today. This year, um, we are really pleased to have started a bursary with ALIA, that's the Australian Library Association. We now have a leader exchange, leadership exchange with them. Originally, that had hoped to be a physical one where people could come back and forward, but obviously through circumstances, that's not happened yet. But the online experience, I think, has been a really valuable one. Closer to home, we now have a, a mem memorandum of understanding with CHILL. Um, so we're, I'd like to collaborate a little bit closer to home as well. And we're particularly pleased this year to have worked with LIRG and RLUK to bring together a, a programme of event, uh, events around research in, in the workplace. Finally, I want to mention advocacy, because right from the start, that is something that HLG has been there to do. We're really proud to work with organisations such as our own parent organisation, SILIP, and with HEE. Um, to make sure that health libraries are recognised through campaigns such as Million Decisions. And again, you'll hear more from that this afternoon. Um, we're particularly proud to see the emphasis on health um, in the latest rounds of honorary fellowships when Chris Whitty was um, awarded his honorary fellowship. Also, Matt Haig and school librarian Amy Mackay, all very different um, backgrounds, but all awarded for their contribution to health and wellbeing across their sectors. So I think that does bring me back to, up to date. Um, I realise it is a very whistle-stop tour and so much information to bring out in one, in one presentation. Um, I am so happy to talk about it, though, so if you see me the rest of the day, please come and ask me questions. <laughs> um, what I do hope I've got across um, is how important the work of HLG is and how, even though you know, we have been going for 75 years. Some of those core things are still there. So the fact that we are a network for all our members to provide support, the fact that we do support people in their careers to get the, the training that they need, and the fact that we advocate for our profession across, across all the sectors that we work in. That really is something to celebrate today. And I'll pass over to Ruth. Thank you to Lindsay and to everybody in the room and also everybody online for joining us. So my name is Ruth Carlyle and I'm all the second of your three Dickensian ghosts, if you like, in terms of I'm actually looking at the present, having looked at the past. So I, as Imran has mentioned, I have the pleasure of being the policy lead on the committee for the Health Libraries Group. Um, my own career started in the pharmaceutical sector. I've spent most of my career to date in the voluntary sector libraries and I currently work in the NHS. So I think quite a broad range of different sectors that I've been involved in and it's therefore my pleasure to be able to draw on that in terms of the breadth of the um, experience. So as we move from past to present, as we think about this inspiring history of 75 years, an institution that predates the NHS and this sector I'm going to give you a picture of actually who we are, who we are as a sector, some of the current themes and the current activities in terms of the breadth of the activities of the Health Libraries Group. So if we start in terms of thinking about where we sit on the global stage, well, if you look at things like the um, International Federation of Library Associations and their global map of libraries, actually they don't have a code for health libraries. So there is a risk that we could think that actually when we look at ourselves on the global stage, that we were actually something a little bit niche, perhaps not something that's recognised as widely internationally as we are here in the UK itself. 
but we are a wide specialist organisation. Linz has already mentioned the HLISD. Oops, I've gone back. The HLISD, so our Health Libraries and Information Services um, Directory, which has been going since 1952. Now, this of itself gives us a really clear picture of the sheer breadth of who we are. So we have 588 libraries listed in this UK directory, covering England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. There are also 1,273 individual contacts listed within directory. This isn't a niche. This is a core profession within um, librarianship and within the NHS. In addition, the listings that we have within the directory indicate just the sheer range of types of professional and professional organisation that we're working with. So our health libraries and information services include the NHS libraries. So these are NHS libraries across England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. We have our counterparts within the Republic of Ireland, which are run through the health service executive. Public health services which are not part of the NHS per se, mostly through local authorities, but have very close linkages through and will have increasingly close linkages through as we begin to develop at an integrated care system level. We have our health and medical libraries that are embedded in academic libraries. Royal Colleges, with their long history of providing library services to specific professional groups, in some instances going back to the Middle Ages, and library access that is, for them, one of the big selling points in terms of why it is that people want to retain their membership of a professional body. And we also have voluntary sector health information services, ranging from the small self-help round a desktop or round a, traditionally round a kitchen table to those that aren't multi-million organisations, where it isn't just the library you might be running, it's also the helpline and um, publications and those sorts of activities, which are all information related. So within our current landscape, we have quite a wide range of users. So we have our own healthcare staff and learners, and these are not just the people who are within the health services and not just in terms of the health services, predominantly NHS libraries but they're also the Royal Colleges and the voluntary sector organisations for specific areas that people support. In an NHS that has a duty to ensure that all decisions are based upon evidence from research, we have increasing numbers of corporate decision makers who are involved in terms of working with their library knowledge services. We also have policy makers, so that we have evidence-informed policy, to ensure that we have the evidence for the future. So alongside these policymakers, we also have researchers and academics. And with voluntary sector and royal college libraries providing the very specific information for specific medical conditions. So a range of different audiences. And all of these, whether directly or indirectly, are providing evidence that is then used for making decisions, shared decisions, we hope, between members of the public and um, healthcare professionals in terms of people's individual care. For all of these, it's essential that our activity is underpinned by policy. Unless you have a policy to hook things upon, actually it's very difficult to ensure and secure the future of knowledge and library services. We have the pleasure at this point in time of actually being quite strongly supported by policy. I would say possibly at the strongest point that we've been in our 75 years. At this present point in time, the NHS has a duty under the Health and Care Act of 2022 to facilitate and promote the use in the health service of evidence obtained from research. We also have a long-term plan for the NHS which emphasises a strong scientific tradition of evidence-based decisions about care that is among the organising principles that have stood the test of time for the NHS. More practically, there is the mandatory guidance that information which is provided for members of the public should be in accessible formats, such as Braille, BSL, so British Sign Language. And we have nice guidance on the need for evidence-based patient information to be used as part of shared decision-making. So a very strong position. 
Libraries also play a specific role in wider strategies, such as within Scotland, the Making It Easier, the Health Literacy Strategy for Scotland. And in each of our nations across the UK, there are strategic frameworks that shape activity. So in England, we have Knowledge for Healthcare, which states that it is essential that the workforce use the right knowledge and evidence at the right time to support decision-making and best practice. Which brings me on in terms of our environment, our landscape, to our health libraries leads. So we are UK-wide, but of course, that does tend to include a little bit of the Republic of Ireland as well in terms of our interrelationships across. And for each of these nations, these five nations, there are organisations that have an official lead library role. So if we're looking at Scotland, it's NHS Education Scotland, which has the lead role for health libraries. If we're looking at England, it's Health Education England. For Wales, Health Education and Improvement Wales. For Northern Ireland, the Healthcare Library of Northern Ireland. And for the Republic of Ireland, the Health Services Executive. The Health Libraries Group works alongside these groups, but also, as Lynn has mentioned, it also works internationally with professional bodies, arranging partnerships with these for the longer term. So what is it we actually do in terms of the roles? So thinking about the themes and what we're actually involved in, how we might be slightly different, perhaps, from our counterparts 75 years ago. Some of the key themes in terms of changes over the last 15 years has been the growth of the number of embedded roles. So people who might, for example, work as clinical librarians or as corporate librarians who are working very specifically with particular teams to make sure that evidence is provided absolutely at the point it's needed, but that also evidence questions are framed as part of discussion. Whilst it may have been implicit 75 years ago in terms of people's roles, we have a much clearer sense of actually how it is that we mobilise knowledge. So we aren't just working with published evidence. We're actually working with the softer knowledge, the knowledge that people have in their heads, the know-how and how it is that we actually frame that in ways that it becomes an asset that can be used for the longer term. Patient information has always been a part of our work particularly in the pharmaceutical and the voluntary sector organisation sectors where patient information has particular requirements. But actually, it's something that we've been doing increasingly across the wider sector and at this point in time, working much more in terms of health literacy, the activities, the skills to be able to access, assess and use health information, not just the evidence base that underlies it. And then there's the wider theme about digitization and digital resources. And we were up there at the front, actually. Other people have just been catching up over the last few decades. Because actually, in the 1980s and 1990s, health librarians were using online and CD-ROM resources. Um, health librarians were among the first to develop websites in the mid-1990s. I don't know about others. I built my first website for health information in 1995, which I think says a lot about the sector that we're working in and others catching up with us. And so we've been increasing access to resources and using digital tools for a long time. And across each of the nations of the UK and Ireland, we have digital resources that have been procured nationally, regionally, and locally. And that of itself is a huge tribute to everybody's collaboration. As part of our current roles in health libraries, it's not just that we actually provide the support and the infrastructure for our own resources, but that we also act as technical hubs, providing skills and support to enable health service staff to be able to use the tools that are provided to them. So Linz has given you an overview in terms of the roles provided by the health libraries group. And just a reminder in terms of how this then sits with where we are now. Because the Health Libraries Group has itself played a key role in terms of enabling the past, the present and the future. And through influencing a range of different developments. Training and events, bringing people together, whether virtually or in person, has been a huge part of what it is that Health Libraries Group has done over time. Including the very widely regarded biennial HLG conferences. It produces the wide range of publications that Lindsay offered, uh, referred to, including the Health Information Libraries Journal, core collections, newsletters. 
the external liaison, sometimes the bits that actually don't necessarily show up in terms of what we do, but setting up exchanges and bursaries with international health library counterparts, responding to con policy consultations to make sure that wherever possible, health libraries are mentioned and acknowledged for the roles that they play. We have prizes and awards and marketing, including collaboration with health education on the A Million Decisions campaigns, all of which are activities that involve and support HLG members. The Health Libraries Group, through all its work, is making sure that we are here now and for the future. This includes our joint work on the A Million Decisions campaign that I just mentioned. And to quote Professor David Loughton, who's CEO at Walsall Healthcare NHS Trust, while the NHS is constantly evolving, with many changes occurring as a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the role of the library team becomes all the more essential. Providing quality information in a fast and changing landscape. Through their work and the A Million Decisions campaign, they arm our clinicians and managers with the skills and confidence to perform at a high standard. The Health Libraries Group provides us with a professional network, professional resources, trainings, training and promotion for the librarians of the future. So, on this, literally the day of our 75th anniversary, we are the Health Libraries Group. We are a group in which all our members have an opportunity to become involved, whether in the committee or in specific projects. And so we pass from the present to the future. Thank you. So happy birthday, members here and members at home. It's fabulous to be here. Um, I'm, as with my colleagues, it's, it's a great privilege to speak at an occasion like this. Um, and I thank you. So as we look towards the future, um, let's be really clear. The prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. I'm Sue Lacey Bryant. I'm delighted to be joining this conversation today. I'm the Chief Knowledge Officer for Health Education England and the National Lead for NHS Knowledge and Library Services in England. I've been a member of Health Libraries Group for just coming up to four decades, and it's will pass over that very swiftly, and it's my privilege to serve on the Sillip Board of Trustees. I've also, um, as with other members in the room, served on the Hill Jill Editorial Advisory Board for, for some years. Now, we know that healthcare is a knowledge-intensive sector, and we know that um, managing and applying knowledge, evidence from research and learning from experience to better effect, applying these things to better effect is part of the solution to the challenges that healthcare faces. So surely a bright future lies ahead for health librarians and members of Health Libraries Group. Yet this is not predetermined. And of course, not everything in the garden is rosy, but it lies in our hands. So let's pause and look at the global context. So demand for healthcare is rising rapidly everywhere. Governments across the globe face the same growing pressures as we do here to reduce costs without limiting access to care. And COVID-19, of course, has exacerbated the challenge of health deficits in terms of the workforce and the imbalance, uh, for example, around the country in the UK. Healthcare professionals are aging and retiring. I try and persuade them not to, um, but nevertheless they are. Uh, and there is a shortage of skilled staff, uh, and that presents really significant challenges, and many of you in the organisations in which you work will be experiencing that on a day-to-day -day basis. Climate change is the biggest health threat facing humanity. Look at the content coming through from the World Health Organization. And technological change is moving at a pace, of course it is. 
while change is, is, is everywhere, actually we have a paradox that has been with us for the last 30 years. It's the 60-30-10 challenge. 60% of healthcare is evidence-based. 30% is some form of waste, low value, and 10% is harm. Only 60% is evidence-based. And this means that while there has been all sorts of change and all sorts of improvements, that performance is essentially flat-lined. So if you want a challenge to take forward into the future, where are we going to impact on that? And we'll be talking about some of those things. And these are sobering thoughts. And with that sobering thought in mind, let's think about the trends that are shaping the future of the healthcare workforce. So non-clinical roles will become ever more important. Providers are going to be looking to prioritise reducing the administrative overhead. We can see that workforce shortages will drive employers to invest in attracting and retaining talent. And the workforce of the future must, of course, be more digitally savvy. Now, this is work that comes out of the, workforce econo the World Economic Forum, and those four trends are shaping the healthcare workforce around the globe. And yes, of course, the digital um, revolution is happening and all that technology is coming. And yet, the Topol Review tells us clearly that technologies will not replace healthcare professionals, but will enhance them, will augment them, giving them more time to care for patients. Bearing in mind that piece around digital savvy, let's start thinking about the skills for the future. And when we think of this as health librarians, we build on this great track record. We've got 75 years worth of CPD, a huge appetite for training and learning as a profession and a huge commitment to doing that and laying that on as, as, as a group. So we, along with everyone else in the workforce, everyone else in the labor market, uh, and this is prediction from McKinsey Global Institute, are going to need three to meet these three criteria. We're going to need to add value beyond what can be done by automated machines and intelligent systems. I think I've said that the wrong way around. <laughs> the same applies. We're going to need to operate comfortably, confidently in a digital environment. We already do. And we're going to need to continually adapt to new ways of working and new occupations. The knowledge specialists of today and tomorrow need to keep up with the pace of change. But when we think about our clinicians, they can no longer keep on top of the pace of change without the right decision support, the right tools, without proactive knowledge services provided by members of HLG, delivered by health librarians and knowledge managers. And I mentioned clinical decision support systems because they're an essential future of the, an essential feature of the future provision of services. The reality is that information overload is such that the brain really can't compute this stuff anymore. The notion of information mastery that our clinicians have been trained in needs to start to embrace clinical decision support reference tools as a normal part of practice, which they demonstrate day in, day out. And this means a greater role for colleagues like ours. They need, clinicians need, managers need, proactive sources <coughs> of content to address that information overload challenge. Excuse me, I'm just going to go. So as we move into this world, our soft skills are going to become ever more important. The things that computers can't do, the collaboration, the support, is all going to become ever more important. Our soft skills are the things that computers are not good at, at which we are excellent. So really important. So what are our priorities for health and care? Well, as I said, when we move and think about the skills for the future, we are building on a great track record. And that is a record of being the human bridge between knowledge sources and knowledge users. 
librarians are trusted. And as our joint Hush a Million Decisions campaign, joint between Health Libraries Group and Health Education England shows, we can really demonstrate impact. We can demonstrate positive impact in a whole series of outcomes, a whole series of, um, uh, of beneficial effects on the bottom line, the bottom line of healthcare, the bottom line of patient experience, staff experience, uh, and, and cost, of course. So there's huge potential for us to play a huge role in the knowledge healthcare economy as we move forward. The focus for us as we go forward is going to be to focus on purpose, on organisational needs and priorities, to show great customer care, to support education, practice, research and innovation. And new challenges were going to emerge. I didn't say this was going to be easy, but now is the time to prepare. Imagine, revisit priorities build our skills. This is the time to be encouraging experimentation and applying what we learn, creating a culture in our workplaces, all of us, um, in which experimentation is encouraged. We need to determine the optimum scale of operation, of course we do, in order to extend service provision using automation where relevant to free up the time of knowledge specialists. And when you think about that breadth of skills that knowledge specialists bring to this, it is an extraordinary range of skills, through from the health literacy aspects, through to people writing you know, things to make their connections into their um, repositories and into discovery systems and all the rest. So all this is needed to drive the benefits of automation and to embark on that collaboration to achieve greater um, economies of scale. That is a must-do. We all read the news, we know the score, it's a must-do. So what are the keys to our success? What will they be? So knowledge and information can be described as the currency of successful healthcare organisations. Key to the success of the organisation, key to the success of knowledge and library specialists and knowledge and library services going forward. Now, survey work by SILIP shows that increasing demand across sectors for decision-ready information delivered by library and information specialists, knowledge managers who are embedded within teams. So those knowledge manager roles and functions, really, really key. And amongst other, amongst other um, elements of the services we provide that we can anticipate receiving a higher priority going forward, uh, of course, teaching information skills will remain important. Knowledge mobilization techniques, much more important. We can see that through the experience of the pandemic already. Facilitating the adoption of proven innovations. How slow we move, best practice. Uh, you know, it might edge up the south coast from Eastbourne to wherever's next, Louise. Thank you so much. Hello, Tom, you're here somewhere. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's so slow. What can we do about that? And what can we do about proven innovation? I'm not only talking about digital innovation, of course, that's very sexy, but what do we do about moving innovation as a profession? This lies ahead for us as a challenge going forward into the future. Nurturing health learning systems, very much the language of the day, but absolutely really critical. How are we going to get that cycle, data, knowledge, into practice, knowledge into action, really feeding learning systems? And again, clinical decision support plays a role there. And for us, therefore, health, and health librarians, health knowledge managers, whatever title we find ourselves carrying, and we saw the difference in titles 75 years ago, whatever they carry, the discipline and the skill and expertise we take forward will remain as that human bridge going forward. So some reimagining to do. This is the time to be reimagining. The SILIP research report on artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc., by Dr. Andrew Cox 
from Sheffield is well worth a read. And if you haven't looked at it for a while, go back because things accelerated um, during the pandemic. Really worth a look. And this talks about the huge opportunity for health information professionals to position themselves as trusted, come back to that word again, trusted information professionals as we go forward, holding a range of roles, offering a authoritative support in which users and people we work with, our colleagues can be confident and helping staff and learners harness those technologies as they go forward. So we're gonna to want to explore and harness these new technologies, new technologies, to reimagine information products, knowledge management tools, knowledge services, ways of working. Um, applications will include the obvious ones that are listed here, and the things we've yet to dream of, and they're only just over the horizon. So new applications and new roles are set to emerge. And to quote Bill Gates, um, we, we always overestimate the change that's going to happen in the next couple of years. We very seriously underestimate the changes that are going to happen over the next 10, and certainly the next 75. So let's not be lulled into inaction. The future is bright for the mix of expertise that we bring, and HLG members bring to our employers across health and care. The future is bright. We need to be building on our strengths. So as we move forward, we're, we're fortunate to be able to do that. The SIDIP Technology Review found that the great strength as we go forward uh, in responding to the opportunities presented by AI, machine learning, and so on, is actually the strong alignment between the existing skill set that we carry and the demands of those new technologies. We're already adept at identifying our skill gaps. We work around our professional knowledge and skills base. Our ethics are central to establishing and maintaining that trust as ethical information workers. And that, sit, that sits at the heart of the PKSB, the professional knowledge and skills base. It's recently been extended to include um, data handling, data science, knowledge management. So we're, as a professional body, we're keeping abreast, we're keeping uh, the description of our competencies well there, and these tools are important for us to check in uh, and move forward and make sure that we're keeping, uh, keeping up, keeping ahead of the curve, looking ahead. So it's a really, really positive story. And yet, the half-life of a learned skill is reckoned to be five years. This means that much of what we as health librarians learned 10 years ago is already obsolete. And half of what we learned five years ago is already irrelevant. And David and I don't want to comment on how much of what we learned is obsolete. So it is all about keeping, looking ahead, eyes on the horizon, and moving forward with skills for the digital age. Now, what do we need then for the skills of tomorrow and today as we go forward. What do we need to thrive? Well, again, the, the Cox report, and I encourage you to look at it, identifies these three categories, comput computational sense, data literacy, which includes AI and algorithmic literacy, data science, data stewardship. It makes recommendations for educators, as well as for us as individuals. Um, education for new entrants to the profession needs to encompass an understanding of AI and machine learning and how it can be applied in our context in librarianship, information science. But there's a need for taster courses and a need for more in-depth courses, and there's a need for hands-on experience, rolling our sleeves up, giving stuff a try. And it won't all work first time. In fact, it probably won't work first time, but we need to build our confidence and become used to it. And you see fabulous examples of that around the country as people test things out. The report also anticipates the need for fusion skills. Now, think communication, creativity, organizational skills all in one basket, all wrapped around those soft skills. Collaboration and the collaborative skills that we have are going to be ever in greater demand. Our facilitative skills will be in ever greater demand. So going forward, 
as now, a key element of our success is going to be about this, about being part of the profession. We are CILIB, and I encourage everyone to get involved. So through CILIB, we can access career support, professional recognition, sector news and analysis through our health libraries group, national representation, training in CPD has been flagged throughout. More broadly, there's financial support, including an extensive range of grants and bursaries that have been mentioned, and there's a dedicated legal advice line too, and a CILIP Benevolent Fund. Now, we are indebted, we here standing today, and those of you at home, are indebted to those who volunteer their time, preparing newsletters, organising and helping us with events, serving on the committee. They lent me this one today. I'm not really on the committee. Um, sharing the committee, and through our career, for each of us as individual, there'll be a time when we can do those things, and there will be times when we can't. We've got too, much, too many other responsibilities, other commitments, too much going on in our lives of work. Of course that's the case. But even then, we can take part in some way. We can read, we can vote, we can tweet. So then we come to the power of our network, the power of your network, our network. Alongside nine regional member networks, three devolved nations, three diversity networks, SILIP has 22 special interest groups, including uh, our sector group. HLG is but one, but the most important one, of course. Our profession is blessed by free floating goodwill that we experience through Health Libraries Group. We take it for granted because it's here when we join in. Go and talk to other professions and hear about their experience of networking. It is an extraordinary thing to which we contribute and from which we receive. It's remarkable. Networking helps us improve our skill set. It opens up opportunities to learn. It builds our knowledge. It helps us keep up to date. Through HLG, we meet people who think like us, people who think the same and people who think quite differently. And colleagues who are spotting opportunities that we've missed and haven't spotted, people who are dealing with the same problems and have already tackled them, or maybe have already succeeded with them. Network is affirming. It's thought-provoking. We can connect with people. Uh, it's just extraordinary. It's an extraordinary gift to have these networks through our careers. And through 75 years, we've learned that connecting with peers, building our networks is invaluable and often fun as well. So the future of HLG lies in our hands. The future of health librarianship lies in our hands. We who are here today, in the room, at home, it lies in our hands. The time to influence executive boards, recruit champions, test thinking, test priorities, try out technologies for the health services of the future is now. The time to recruit new members of Health Libraries Group is now. There isn't anyone else to do it, it's us. It's we in this room and those at home, in offices, in home offices, in sheds, wherever you are, guys. So, you know, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Where we are and where Health Libraries Group will be in five years' time, in 10 years' time, in 75 years' time is based on the decisions we make now. Let's be lucky. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Um, we've had a run through the past, the present, and the future, and there are so many opportunities to get involved with HLG, collaborating, collaborating with other SIGs, um, other networks, nationally, internationally, 
So please do come and talk to us today about you know, how you can help, how you can join. You don't have to be an official committee member. You can be one of our micro volunteers. We've got so many opportunities that you can help with. So please do come and uh, talk to us. So um, time for questions. We've had some brilliant um, presentations. So if there are any questions on the floor first and then I'll go online. Please raise your hands if you have a question or a comment. There's been lots of um, chatter on Twitter, which is great. Any observations? Anne? I, I, it's all right, we've got plenty of time. We can all have a, all have a... I, I just wanted to say a big thank you to HLG. At the start of my career, uh, I, I got to go to the Medical Health and Welfare Library Group Conference. And I was so welcomed, and it was brilliant. And I hope, as has been said, that that will carry on um, with members, that they'll continue to welcome like I was welcomed. So just a big thank you. Thank you, Anne. I didn't put my hand up, but my name's Anne, so I think there's some confusion. <laughs> but, yeah, let me speak for a moment. Yeah, I did um, find it really interesting when you said about revisiting priorities. With my team, I do sit down and we have a priority setting workshop maybe every six months, and it is amazing how much we have to change it each time. We do put our emphasis on um, supporting trust initiatives, which goes down so well at our trust and of course builds our profile one person will speak to the next and somebody else will be coming to us to um, support what they're doing so yeah just enjoyed hearing all of that thank you thank you Anne. any comments from the panel we do have some mics on the floor if you do want to say anything it's next to Ruth Dorothy there. say something <laughs> We have a number of people in the room who have come back um, today. <laughs> from, well, well, in your case, from several centuries, actually. Um, it, it would be interesting to know what those who have rejoined today after a great career. Uh, um, sad to see them all go. I think some of them are sitting at the same table, too. Thanks, Sue. I've always done what you said. <laughs> I think I first met Sue in 1997. Um, my sister has accused me of my tweet making it look like I've been in Health Libraries Group for 75 years. Um, not quite true. But I think it's, it is nice to be back and to see people. Um, and also, in the historical presentation, the message of you know, health libraries group taking over from some other groups that were much more um, separated. I have memories of actually shaking with anger when a dean's secretary refused to let me even post um, questionnaires to librarians who weren't medical librarians or who weren't supported by the dean. So even a public health librarian wasn't a medical librarian because the dean didn't pay. And yeah, that was quite a long time ago, but within living memory, and we just have to remember that everybody's involved in providing health care, and, uh, and we've changed things over that time. Thank you, Dorothy, and things are ever-changing. And all the groups that were mentioned, you know, we've, some of them we've embraced, and, uh, you know, our business as usual, other groups were embracing as well, and we're taking on new work streams. Um, Potenza, are there any questions online? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, so I was busy for the panel. I'm probably motoring for Sue. Uh, so I was thinking about the future of library services. Um, my local trust are building green rooms and virtual reality training. So I'm just wondering how where is the line for us to take there for virtual training and green rooms is a bit different. So any thoughts on that? 
Yes. <laughs> they, they, my, my son did his dissertation on virtual reality um, in, in architecture. And at the time, I, I was, he seemed to spend most of his time playing some game that involves sabers in, in the hallway while this research was going underway. But anyway, he turned out to do extraordinarily well with it. But yeah, I mean, clearly this has got applications. And I think uh, as we go forward in terms of the way in which we support education, um, and also some aspects of clinical therapy, uh, virtual reality will be clearly more important, definitely as a learning tool, but also as a tool for distraction, uh, a tool for helping people um, uh, understand what, what an experience is going to be like, whether that's a patient or indeed a clinician uh, applying VR with simulation. So I would expect it to be certainly embedded within teaching environments as we go forward. I would also say, though, that VR was around in 1995, and when I was the program manager for the Topol Review, I showed people um, uh, a Tomorrow's World from 1995, which said VR was the top thing and was going to be on our doorsteps within a year or so. And this was just to remind people about the timelines with which things happen. Uh, actually, I think VR may have gone off into a defence environment and then come back to us for application in social context. That's my my personal take. Did that answer your question? Um, possibly not, no. Say, <laughs> I, I just, I, and that's the very best, thi very best thing about conversations. What are you asking me? So yeah, okay. So you mean rather than a, re you mean rather than a resource which um, which which we provide out of libraries? Do we, can we see the applications yeah. for it? So have we got anybody here who's involved in e-learning and developing e-learning? Do you think we might use these kinds of things to develop information skills or critical appraisal? Um, what do you think, Natasha? What would your students be saying? Yeah. Uh, what I really think is that actually the applications of these technologies individually, I'll come to you in a sec, Natasha, individually these things are interesting and they might pass through. I mean, David and I remember tech that was introduced when we were at uni that disappeared after a lot of money had been spent in it, which I guess is where you're coming from. But actually it's when technologies combine that you get a synthesis and you get new solutions that we hadn't thought of. What, what do you think, Natasha? Yeah, so thanks, Sue. So, um, yeah, for those who don't know, I'm doing a little bit of lecturing for UCL on their uh, librarianship course at the moment. And um, I think it's very interesting the kind of ideas that they come in with and also the stuff that they're learning. So the um, module they're doing at the moment about the digital stuff is all sorts of things that I really know very little about. And they're getting... Um, put straight into having to build new technologies, new resources and stuff, just like from scratch. Like they started two weeks ago and they, this, this term, they've got to build a thing. So I'd like to think that they'll be up for just um, embracing it and being ready, like we've said, to, you know, this might be the thing for the next five years or whatever, but then we're going to have to move on to the next yeah. thing. So it's that being adaptable thing. So be interesting to see what they come up with. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Natasha. Any other comments in the room? No? Oh. Alan? You're getting your health and well-being in early. Uh, so, uh, Alan Fricker, I, I suppose the thing that's interesting is thinking back to my student days is we did lots of stuff building databases and 
um, learning about how retrieval worked and some of those things. And I think that's the, the interesting bit is we keep in mind this history, these things that we did. And yes, I'm not building relational databases about holidays anymore, thankfully. Um, but I am seeing the consequences of decisions that people make. And I'm helping people see the importance of the decisions that they make about retrieval and where those retrievals are driving things in their direction. So we've got this kind of path through. And I suppose that's, that's the kind of the interest in the question is, is where else do we see these particular, in the panel perhaps, um, these particular kind of um, bedrocks of, of our kind of practice um, really uh, undercutting, un underpinning uh, our future developments? So it's Ruth just coming in. Terms, I think there is something about the application and the imagination to apply. And very often it's, we get confused by thinking that the channel is something different and that actually it's just another way of applying our core skills. So things like our metadata skills, our indexing skills, they're still pretty core to how these new kits are applied. And I was thinking in terms of many of the resources that um, are developed for patient information. Um, certainly pre-pandemic, when people were using cash much more, quite a few um, chemotherapy units would show people, this is what the money looks like in your hand to help you to get the right change for catching the bus to go to your chemotherapy. And this is the fly-through so you can see where you come in. This is what, the, what somebody will ask you, those sorts of things. And whilst we're not absolutely building those sorts of tools, what we have are the skills to critique where they do or do not apply and actually thinking about what it is that we actually want to have for the future. So I think coming back in terms of the question, as with so many things, green screen, VR, they will have applications. There's something about using them wisely and using them which in ways that really take into account our critiquing skills and you know, never, never, never give up your responsibility and your right to be able to think critically about the application as much as anything else. Because that's, that's what we're about as a profession. Lovely. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and thank you, Sam, online for a great question. Um, I think, um, Ms. Potenza, do we have another question? One more? Okay, this is the final question before we go into break. Um, it's from Andrew Booth. Andrew, are you okay to unmute? Or not? Do you want me to read it out? Oh, here you go. Just on. It's working. I can't even work a microphone. Um, yes, thank you, Andrew. It's lovely to see you too. Um, uh, we've moved on, but as always with that, that kind of story, there is an enormous amount to do. Some of you will remember uh, when I was still at president in 2019, one of my presidential themes was how are we going to build the evidence base for librarianship? Um, and that's a question that we have asked continually over, well, over the lifetime of my career, which is now 40 years. And Andrew and I did some work on that some years ago, founding the Healer Network, which was to bring together librarians who were interested in research, um, academics who obviously are interested in research, publishers, and so on. And we, we, we had some interesting early days discussions about how we might all work together to build the evidence base of librarianship. And it didn't quite work out the way um, I think we intended because we, we hit a problem. And we hit a problem of, well, there's lots of enthusiasm and we know there are lots of gaps in the evidence, but who's going to fund it? And, and the money did become quite an issue. And we had academics in the room who were looking at us, health, uh, us, us folk in the NHS thinking we were a pot of money. And we were looking at the academics thinking, surely they just want to do it. Um, so it didn't quite work out as we intended. What I'm delighted to be able to say, and I know colleagues who are still working could, could say more perhaps during the break, 
is that um, research into health librarianship remains alive and if you look at the work Health Education England has done in terms of the gift of time, research into how, what, what is the return on investment that health librarians bring to the system. It's fantastic research. If you haven't looked at it, please do so. There is other research afoot and Ruth leads our research program. Um, but it needs a, a focus on research. We need to always remember there's more to do. So that's not really an answer, but it's kind of where we're at. Ruth or Sue, did you want to add? If I, if I can add on to that. So from, from thinking of it from two perspectives, and I should declare an interest in terms of hats that I'm um, the head of Norwegian Library Service Midlands East and North at Health Education England, as well as being on the HLG committee. And in terms of the HLG perspective and actually the HEE perspective, I think here there are actually very close commonalities because a lot of what is being done both through the Health Libraries Group and through Health Education England is to do with development of skills and confidence to apply those skills in terms of research and then looking out where it is that we can actually look in terms of resources further through. So working in terms of from a, from a Health Education England perspective on the development of a programme, a bit like our leadership development programme, but specifically to develop research skills with research project experience. And as was alluded to earlier on, um, the, the work by Health Libraries Group in terms of collaboration for research workshops to be able to inspire people through. I think so much of this is not just about the money, it's about the skills and the confidence to be able to do these things. And I think that this is something that HLG is very much involved in, in terms of its activity. Final comment from Sue. Can I just round that off? So just, just to say that, you know, from Health Education England, we, we sponsored the technology, the SILIP technology review, as we saw the importance of it coming out of the work. So that's, that's an area where we've contributed. I think two points to us, you know, I'll do the sandwich. So we've got, we've got the great technology review. Um, that, that seemed to be an extraordinary habit of people to only look uh, for research or evidence or publications in the last three, five, ten years. We are celebrating a 75-year history. Some of this work's been looked at before, I believe, David. Is that, is that right? Just, just many times. Um, uh, and and much, of it, much of it through, through the, the skill and influence of people like Andrew, um, who, has, who has brought a rigour to looking at evidence-based practice, which is exceptional. So we thank you, Andrew. And, and to add to that, we in the, have the same challenge as clinicians. How are we going to drive compelling, how are we going to gather and then drive compelling real-world evidence of efficacy and efficiency, cost-effectiveness, as we take forward innovation? So we're very good at sharing best practice, best practice, how good are we at critiquing it, or indeed of revealing, like we say about them, as just as we say about the medics and their research, we must share what didn't work because that's what saves other people time. So, but we have a great track record of sharing and it's fabulous. We're gonna see more about that today. Lovely, thank you. That's a great note to end on. So uh, we can continue the discussion uh, during break um, and please be back in the room at 11.40. A big round for our panel, please.
information specialist.